Good morning. Welcome this morning to Waynesville United Methodist Church. It's good to see you all today. A couple of quick announcements for you as we prepare for worship together. Um, one I'd like to point out is uh, next Sunday the 19th and also Sunday the 26th we'll be participating in the Super Bowl, S-O-U-P-E-R, Super Bowl of Caring. Uh, there'll be a little bit more about that uh, later on in the service. Uh, but what's good for you to remember is that we're collecting items such as peanut butter and jelly and soup and crackers to uh, support the uh, Evangel Food Pantry which serves our zip code here in 14221. Also on the back of your messenger, if you follow along, there's a gentle reminder that uh, next week is the annual church conference or church meeting. Uh, we'll be following the 11 o'clock worship service back in the parlor. Um, there'll be a soup lunch served. I hear rumors of dessert. I don't know for sure, though. But you all always have sweets, so I'm thinking probably yes. Um, <clears throat> soup lunch with the meeting to follow. Uh, and so if you plan on uh, attending, it would be great to help plan for food if you just contact the church office and let us know. Any other announcements this morning? Seeing none, would you uh, stand in body or in spirit and join me in this morning's call to worship? In the very beginning, God separated the darkness and the light. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. We were once people who dwelt in darkness, but God has given us the true light, Jesus Christ. God has blessed us and adopted us as God's own beloved children through the sacrament of baptism. The water of baptism brings to us healing and reconciliation. It is a symbol of nourishment and cleansing. And so today we remember Jesus' baptism. And to hear the words of his baptism, let us be reminded of our own adoption by God and celebrate the joyous connection to the Almighty God. Our opening hymn this morning is in the hymnal number 252, When Jesus Came to Jordan. be seated and join me in the morning prayer. Creator God, when everything first began, water became a symbol of refreshing, of washing away, of renewing. Through the waters of creation, 
you brought forth abundant life. We have gathered this day to remember Jesus' baptism and how you were very well pleased. In his baptism, Jesus' ministry was initiated. He gathered his death to you completely and without reservation. You, to be of service to you by serving the world. In our world there is war, oppression, hunger, and alienation. We have not been good stewards of this world. We have not cared for one another. Heal us and this world, Lord. Renew us with your life-giving waters and reaffirm our baptisms as your children. Let us go forth to be people of peace and mercy. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I mentioned to you earlier that we will be uh, participating in the Super Bowl, S-O-U-P-E-R Super Bowl. We won't be participating in the S-U-P-E-R Super Bowl this year. And I wanted to share with you just a little bit about what the Super Bowl of Caring is and in 2019 uh, what this coordinated effort was able to do. The Super Bowl of Caring helps to empower uh, youth and to unite communities, uh, both churches and schools and other organizations, uh, to inspire care and compassion for hungry people in the world around us. By working together, we can demonstrate how our collective efforts can make a significant impact in our neighborhoods in need. And so in 2019, across our country, um, they had <clears throat> excuse me, almost 4,900 groups participate. You all were one of them, raising over $9.6 million and over 74 million meals worth of food. That's a lot of soup. And that affected over 3,500 charities. And so when we participate in the Super Bowl of Caring, you bring your items in. We have some fun. The youth group usually sponsors coffee hour and provides uh, tailgate food and decor, which is fun and, ex and uh, exciting to do. But the more important part is the collective effort of all of us working together and the good that can become uh, from it. And so this year, we hope that instead of 74 million meals that are raised and collected and provided for, that maybe we could provide even more than that, 80 million or 90 million. Stop at your local grocery store and pick up a lot of cans so we can further the, that message even a little bit further. <clears throat> but what we do is uh, we report our collecting to the Super Bowl of caring, and then they gather all that information and put it all together so they can see collectively on that day what happens. When we uh, try to harness the excitement of Super Bowl, S-U-P-E-R-B-O-W-L, and do something good with it. This moment, we're going to uh, take an opportunity that we don't get to do very often and uh, enjoy passing of the peace with one another. So would you stand and greet each other with the love of Christ this morning? <laughs> this is like when the cat's away, the mice play sort of thing. It's As we enter now into a time of <clears throat> God sightings and joys and prayer concerns, I wonder if you have any that you'd like to share today. Sydney. That's exciting. Where in France are you going? So let me know and I'll meet you there and we'll have lunch. <laughs> 
that seemed like a good idea. Right? <laughs> Other joys or prayer concerns? Yes, Twink. took the words out of my mouth. Congratulations. <clears throat> Other joys or prayer concerns today? I have two, actually. Um, my sister is having some upper respiratory issues that are not going away. And I got a phone call from a childhood friend of mine, Tom, who I've known for years. And he may have um, bladder cancer. So we can keep both of them in our prayers. All right. We'll pray for your sister to get over crud and for Tom and his possible cancer. Thank you. Uh, Jerry and I met a lady at um, Dash's after church one Sunday, and she got talk- we got talking to her, and she got talking to us, sharing the, there's a little fireplace there, and we were sharing to eat. And um, it turned out she was from Eastern Hills, Westland. So they are praying for our mission of peace. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Barbara, way in the back. Yes. You might remember last year on Christmas Eve, uh, Kathy, who was the nursery care attendant, fell and broke an ankle. And so this, now over a year, is the the whole recovery process. So let's continue to pray for her. Alan. We'll continue to pray for Keo. Yes. those in need of healing. Any others today? All right. Seeing none, you can remain seated and we'll sing our prayer hymn together. It's in the hymnal number 502. Thy holy wings, O Savior. you join your hearts with mine as we go to God in prayer together. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you this morning, pausing from the rigors of our daily lives and the to-do list that we have piled up. We come here seeking renewal, restoration, and reconnection with you, God as we celebrate Jesus' baptism. And yet we are keenly aware of the pain of the world around us and those that we hold dear. 
And so, God, we lift up to you today those that are in need of healing. Those that are suffering from organ failure. Those that are in need of healing from surgery, like Kathy. Those such as Tom and Keo that are fighting cancer. And we pray that your healing hand might fall upon them. We thank you for the opportunity for travel to new places and new experiences, God. We ask that you watch over Sydney and keep her safe while she's away. We thank you for the joy of birth of great-grandchildren. What a gift they are. And we lift up to you, God, other areas of concern, such as those traveling on the mission of peace and those other things that we hold deep within the recesses of our hearts. And so today, God, as we seek our reconnection with you, help us to see more clearly how we can be your agents of peace in a world that is full of conflict and violence so that your peace might persevere. For it's in your Son, Jesus' name, that we pray this day, as he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, in acknowledgement that all the things that we have are gifts from God, uh, let us give back to God out of gratitude for what we received. Will the ushers please come forward?
Lord, you established a covenant with us all. Whatever we give, time, talents, treasures, our prayer is a gift we have already received. We joyfully give back from a grateful, grateful heart. We worship God in holy splendor with our giving. Amen. You may be seated. Again, two readings from the Bible this morning. The first is from page 820 in the New Testament, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not fail to or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prisons, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to graven images. Behold the former things that have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Matthew in the New Testament, chapter 3. On page three, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, You shall indeed hear, but never understand. You shall indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are heavy of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn to me to heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see and do not see it, and to hear what you hear but do not hear it. This is the word of God for the people of God. This morning we celebrate and remember the baptism of Jesus. When you think chronologically about the life of Christ, this almost seems a little out of order to me. We've just come through Advent, right? And Christmas comes and we're celebrating the infant baby. Last Sunday, we remember and celebrate the arrival of the kings bringing the gifts on Epiphany. And then all of a sudden, here we are, Jesus as an adult being baptized. Well, what about everything that happened in between? Surely there's other stuff that happened, right? Well, yes, surely there is. Thank you for nodding. But there's a reason that in the church calendar we observe these things in this order. Have you ever done a uh, 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 dot by dot or dot dot to dot, you know, where you follow the numbers and when you draw all of them it makes some sort of shape or whatever? That's kind of like what this church calendar looks like. 
We had one dot that was Advent, and we had another dot that was Christmas, and another dot that was Epiphany, and another dot that is celebrating Jesus' baptism. And as we're working to connect these dots, we'll see more clearly an image that is formed when we put all these things together. But just like a dot to dot, unless it's a really easy one, and you look at just all the, the splotches on the paper, you might not quite understand the picture that's being painted. And so let me share with you this morning the, bat- the story of Jesus' baptism. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have, been, uh, John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Don't come to see me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now. For it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom... I am well pleased. In a time of unsettledness in our greater church and throughout the world around us, today we come back to some foundational theology of who we are as people. We began with Christmas, as I mentioned, an awestruck reflection on the activity of God choosing to come to live amongst us in flesh. Next we came to Epiphany, the core of our understanding of who Jesus is, a king, for they came bearing gifts for the king. And it's worthy of reaffirmation in the life of the church each year. And this year we pause and we reflect on the gift given to us through baptism as we claim the grace of Jesus for ourselves. Today's Gospel reading focuses on Jesus' baptism and the Gospel of Matthew specifically. Yet the whole reason that Jesus chose to participate in John's call to a baptism of repentance is to express solidarity, to express some unity with people in need of grace. That would be us. We are all present with Jesus in that water, and we can rightly celebrate our baptism as we honor his. And yet, to me, it seems like Matthew kind of understates this event. Baptism is a big deal, right? When you have a family member that's being baptized, usually the whole family comes and gathers. You know, There's a big assembly of people. There's a certificate. We give a candle and a blankie. And sometimes there's cake after worship. It's a big, big deal. And yet for Matthew, you, you almost miss the weight of this moment because it's a brief five verses that are given to tell the whole story. All the questions that we really need answered are seemingly unimportant to Matthew. And they're not things like, what was the baby wearing? Or... Who stood next to the child? Who was the sponsor, right? The issues that cause debates and divisions, things such as how much water or what age or in what way and the precise liturgical wording of the ritual itself, none of those things appear in the account. Thanks for nothing, Matthew. You could have cleared up a lot of things for us. Having waded through John's preparing the way during Advent... We now get to the point. Jesus appears, as Matthew tells us, to be baptized by John. And John has a problem with this, right? Jesus, I'm not even qualified to take off your shoes. You should be baptizing me. I am not. This is beyond my pay grade. And interestingly enough, in the Gospels, Matthew is the only one to give us this conversation between the two of them. Perhaps the intent is to help explain this unexpected behavior on the part of Jesus. John tells us that John's baptism was one of repentance from sin, acknowledging a desire to turn from the life that one was living. Jesus participated in this as a way of standing with us, 
claiming that there was no limit to God's overwhelming love. There's still no limit to God's overwhelming love. Let it be so for now, Jesus says, and the now is important. Now is about the identification with humanity, with us. Now is telling us that even though Jesus is defined, that he can still identify with you and me. And this is vastly different than the belief in God that we see in other cultures. Some people saw God as a puppet, playfully mimicking or causing the people down on earth to crash into each other to see what would happen. Some saw God as ambivalent. Some were unaware. Some were uninvolved. Some as cruel, causing bad things to happen to see what would happen to the chess pieces on the world. But that's not our view of God. That's not who we believe God is. And that's not who we believe Jesus is. Now is about Jesus' identification not as an essential nature of Christ. Or rather, it's, it's Christ's essential nature is about that identification, who Jesus is. The righteousness that he is fulfilling is the righteousness of the mission. I can only be who I need to be in this way. I can do what I am here to do in this way. And so it's the same with us. And then John consents. John consents to the baptism. Reluctantly, it seems to me. Okay, Jesus, I guess I'll baptize you. Consented doesn't sound like wholehearted support, really, does it? It's kind of like asking someone for a favor, and their response is not, I would love to do that, but uh, I guess I could do that for you. The Greek here that is translated to consented could also be translated into tolerates, or to let go, or to release. So John is tolerating this request of Jesus. John is letting go of his own pre-assumptions to baptize Jesus. John is releasing his own anxieties about baptizing Jesus. Maybe John did have misgivings. Maybe he understands what's really going on, but he doesn't see the bigger picture yet because he only can see one small part. And yet he consented. At least we assume so. If you read very closely, you see that Matthew, knows, Matthew says nothing about the actual baptism. John consents to it, and then the very next verse says when Jesus had been baptized. We missed the moment. There was no photo finish. Just glazed over. Perhaps we've been wrestling with the wrong things. Maybe it isn't about the amount of water used or the position of the body being baptized. Maybe it isn't about the right formula or the specific words spoken. Maybe it isn't about the person being baptized at all. Maybe it's about the relationship being established in the act of baptism. A relationship with the God who pours down grace and a relationship with the community that receives that grace-filled new member into the body of Christ. John might have been uncertain, unable to see the big picture, but the voice from heaven proclaimed that God was not hesitant and that God claimed this moment wholeheartedly. The heavens open, the spirit descends, and the voice speaks and says, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So what was all that for? Who was all that for? The opening of heaven and the voice coming from on high. Matthew says that he saw the spirit. Not they, but he seems to me that that indicates that it was a private vision for Jesus. But the voice says, this is my beloved, not you are my beloved. And it seems to me that maybe this is an announcement to everybody else of what's happening. 
you look in the other Gospels or different translations of the, bo- of the book, they're just as vague on this case. But it seems like the vision was for Jesus, but the pronouncement of being my son who is well pleased was for everyone to hear. Who is this theophany for? Do you all know the word? you familiar with the word theophany? It's church language. And all it really means is God making God's presence known through nature. Uh, you might hear of a rushing wind or an earthquake, and then God is present. That's what a theophany is, this appearance of God. And so who is it for? Well, friends, it's for us. It's for us to hear just as clearly today as it was centuries ago. The readers, the church that would be constituted, created by baptism. That's why Matthew tells us this story. It is so that we know first that Jesus claimed solidarity to be in unity with us by claiming a baptism of repentance, even though he didn't need to repent for anything. We also share in the pleasure of God who claims us all as beloved children. First, this is about Jesus, the one that we follow, the one that we are making disciples of. Then, only then, is it about us. And so celebrate baptism. Celebrate belonging. Celebrate that God is well pleased with each and every one of you, for you are God's beloved children. You are the body of Christ. Baptism by the way, is not only a sign of profession, but it's also a mark of difference whereby Christians are distinguished from others that are not baptized. It's also a sign in the United Methodist tradition of regeneration or of rebirth, being made new again. And for us, the baptism of young children, infants, all the way to people more experienced in life, We are all available to accept God's grace. The nature of baptism is an initiation into a movement. Just as Jesus is formally being initiated and carrying forward the ministry of John the Baptist, who picks up the ministry of the prophets, by the way, so our baptisms initiate us into the story of what God is doing or going to do in the world. Redemption. And so I wonder, do, do any of you remember your baptism? A couple of you? A couple of you. Do you remember maybe who was there? Or you might remember family members of the pastor that performed it? Were you aware of, in terms of what baptism meant for you in your life at that time? You might have. I fall in the camp of not remembering my baptism. How about the rest of you? Not remembering. I was too little. I know the pastor that, that, that baptized me. I know his name at least. And I know the date because my mom just gave me the certificate last week when she was cleaning out boxes in her house. Thank you, Mom, for holding on to that. You see, many of us don't have a memory of our baptism. Some of us are fortunate enough that we do. But that doesn't mean that we have not experienced its impact in our lives. And so today I want to invite you to have an opportunity to remember your own baptism. Either because you have an actual memory of it, or because you are able to come and to celebrate the impact of that baptism on your life. And so we're going to uh, sing, I think it's 393 in just a couple minutes. And while the music is playing, you're welcome to come forward and to touch the water here in the bowl. Uh, and there are some um, glass rocks that seems like an oxymoron. But you can take one with you uh, and hold it and remember as a symbol of you remembering your baptism and remembering that you are God's beloved children with whom God is well pleased. And so as the music plays, you're welcome to come forward as you felt led to.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, thank you for this gift, this gift of baptism, that we remember, God, that you chose us first. And so now we acknowledge that, and we choose you too. We pray that as we prepare to leave from this place, that your spirit might fill us, that it might renew us, that it might sustain us, to, the be, to be the people that you call us to be as we leave these walls going out into your world. All these things we pray in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.